Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. As of 2023, about 40% of all American homes were getting high-speed internet access via a cable provider, someone who brings a coax cable to your home and you get a cable modem and you get internet access. If you've paid any attention, you can see that a lot of cable companies are offering higher and higher speeds to your home. Those plans now offer very often up to a gig of internet high-speed data that can be brought to your home. Now, whether you can afford it or not is a totally another question, but they are offering higher speed plans. How is that possible? How are they able to deliver high-speed data over a coax cable? And that's what our topic is about, is looking at a technology called DOCSIS. Right now, the new standard is DOCSIS 3.1. Very few companies have implemented the latest standard, which is DOCSIS 4.0. But let's dive in and learn how this incredibly complex technology delivers Ethernet to your door. Here are some of the latest speeds from the various cable companies, the largest cable companies. Spectrum now delivers up to a gig to your home. Infinity now delivers up to six gigabytes to your home. That's why you saw in the picture before, this router is able to work with Affinity's cable network because it has a 10 gigabit WAN port which is absolutely unheard of. MediaCon delivers up to a gig in some areas, and we know that it depends on where you are in the cable system, whether you get access to those higher speeds. Cox delivers up to 940 megabits, and WOW, which is in the western part of the United States, can deliver up to 1.2 gigabits. We've come a long way from 28.8 modem speeds. Most of your new home routers now come with at least a 2.5 gigabit WAN port. That's amazing. Here's one of the latest home routers from Asus and they even have a optical SFP plus connector so you can plug in a fiber optic transceiver and you can actually bring 10 gigs to this home router. Now keep in mind cable companies have in the past been the primary way of delivering video content. Through that coax cable that comes to your house, that is RF technology, and it was ideal for delivering video. And they really didn't have any way of delivering data until around 2000. And they turned to a company called Cable Labs to give them a hand in how to develop a technology that they could use RF to deliver Data. In the early 2000s, cable companies had connected to hundreds of millions of homes, and they had the last mile connected to those users. But those users wanted high-speed internet, or at least in the early days, just any speed to the internet. There was no high speed. And they were positioned perfectly to do that, but they needed a way to take their RF distribution system that delivered video very well. How could they take this same architecture and turn it in and deliver data also to the subscribers? Cable companies have been using coax cable, shown in this picture, to deliver RF video for years, but they needed a technology where they could leverage the same transmission line. And from an engineering point of view, this is simply a transmission line. How could they take this same mechanism, add the necessary technology components so they could send data down this coax cable? Cable Labs was the research and development company specializing in RF technology. Basically, it's a bunch of RF engineers and software programmers who helped develop a framework called DOCSIS. DOCSIS 1.0 was the early initial launching of a technology where they could take their RF distribution and start modulating data across that RF distribution. And 
cable modems were born. Now, Cable Labs is no slouch when it comes to engineering. They have developed the passive optical networks that run at 10, 25, and 50 gigabits, known as PON. They also develop point-to-point -point coherent optics, where a single fiber can carry upwards of 50 terabits per second in both directions. They also help develop DOCSIS, which is this data over RF for the cable companies. They also cooperated with Wireless Alliance and developed the Wi-Fi Easy Mesh. And you're seeing a lot of Wi-Fi products, even for your home, where you can take multiple access points and they work coherently together as a single network. They've also worked on the LoRa server for the low power wide area networks being developed for IoT, as well as intelligent wireless network steering, which allows seamless transition between different types of wireless products. Now, when they developed DOCSIS, which works at OSI Layer 1, OSI Layer 2, they actually went and borrowed a lot of the technologies that were using in 802.11 technologies, wireless, the cellular LTE and 5G technologies, such as orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. We're using that in DOCSIS. The quadrature amplitude modulation, where we're using amplitude and phase to modulate the signal. We're using channel bonding, same features that we're using in 5G and in wireless, and then forward error correction. So a lot of wireless technology is also included in DOCSIS. Now, anytime you get involved in RF, radio frequency, it is complex. Now in Europe, when they use cable video, they were based on the PAL standard and they dedicated up to eight megahertz bandwidth for each channel, which actually gave them a better video. In North America, we were based on the NTSC or the ATSC standard, which we dedicated about six megahertz per channel, and that was strictly video delivery. So DOCSIS is basically a technology at layer one, layer two, it's RF, and we're going to take our data, our Ethernet data, we're going to modulate that RF signal, and we're going to send it down a coax cable. Now, we're also going to bring fiber into this distribution system, and we'll talk about that. So why coax for the last mile connection? Why didn't they dis decide to move to fiber only and bring fiber to every home? Well, number one, it's cheaper by a long shot. And coax gives cable operators the bandwidth they need to deliver both video and data up to three gigahertz at 75 ohms. Based on its cost to your home, it was ideal to bring this type of technology. And cable operators already had about 40% of all households connected to their systems by 2023. By the way, in 2019, it was over 47%. So they've lost a little bit to telcos bringing fiber when we talk about DOCSIS, we're using RF at layer one. We're also using their own specific type of layer two, but remember RF is layer one. Now, if you were to look with this piece of test equipment, this is what you would see on your coax cable coming into your cable modem. You would see RF signal and it's broken into sections. These are, these are called channels. You have about a gigabit of bandwidth for these channels to deliver upstream and downstream data. If your cable plan provides only a certain amount of speed to your home, you'll get X amount of these channels. As you pay for a higher speed of internet delivery to your home, you're going to get more and more of these channels that are going to be bonded together to give you that speed. Cable companies deliver both video content as well as data. I am not gonna talk anything about video delivery. I'm gonna talk strictly about data. Now the DOCSIS standard has started at DOCSIS 1.0 and moved all the way to 4.0. Very few people have implemented 4.0. Very few cable operators have even implemented DOCSIS 3.1. Most of them are between DOCSIS 2.0 and DOCSIS 3.0. Just like cellular companies are struggling to go from LTE to 5G. You know, they put in two 5G towers in the city and they claim, you know, they have 5G. 
Yeah, right. It's very expensive to implement this change, these advances in the Stoxa standard. So it takes a long time to get from DOCSIS 2.0 to DOCSIS 3.1. As cable operators approached putting data across their RF network or their RF transmission line, and that's what their cable system is, is a very large, complicated transmission line. They found that data was very complex because it has to be right when it gets to that modem or they're going to get packet drops. Believe me, during the COVID lockdown, cable companies were faced with excruciating problems because all of a sudden the workforce was now at home depending on data delivery to their homes. Trust me, they had to work out a lot of bugs in the cable system to get this right. Now, one area that we're not going to talk about in terms of data is the data center. I'm not going to go into that because their data centers are very similar to ours. The only difference is they call them head ends and they have lots of video material in their data centers. So I'm not going to talk about data centers. I'm going to focus on the three major components that make data delivery work. That is the CMTS. This is a special piece of equipment that really is the heart and soul of data delivery. Then their hybrid fiber coax network. That's what's between you, the CMTS and your cable modem. And that's how DOCSIS works. Now this architecture that you see before you is the latest, greatest architecture for cable companies. Very few cable companies are using this structure right now. This is known as remote PHY, or remote physical. It is getting rid of a lot of the old components and it is setting the stage for full duplex, 10 gigabit to the house. This diagram shows you what many cable companies are at at this point, where they have CMTS. Remember, this is a very important piece of equipment as it runs your cable modem. And when you call for tech service, the information that that technical support person who's helping you with your cable modem, he's looking inside CMTS. CMTS pulls data out of your cable modem and also pulls information out of the entire cable plant about your RF delivery so they can see and hopefully troubleshoot your problem. Let's look carefully at this diagram because we see CMTS is your main equipment responsible for delivering data and communicating and making sure your cable modem is getting the RF modulated data that it needs to function. You've got an RF system for downstream, goes through lots of fiber optic until it gets down to these fiber nodes. These are very important. Fiber nodes get you all the way to your neighborhood and it doesn't turn into coax until it gets as close as possible to your neighborhood area where they're going to then break out from fiber, go to coax, and then coax is gonna be the last mile. Look at your diagram on your left. This is a typical data distribution of a cable company. You see your core network, you see your hub, your distribution of fiber, you've got your fiber nodes. Remember, that's bringing fiber as close to your neighborhood as possible. And then it switched to coax, and then it's tapped off into your home. Notice beneath it, we see the digital baseband, then we see analog fiber, and then we see coax. Now look at the diagram on your right. This is where cable companies, because they're able to deliver with DOCSIS 3.1, they can deliver low latency network. They're now reaching out to 5G towers and bringing the, what they call the front hall because they can run that cable a long way and bring that information back into their data centers, hand it back off to the cellular companies. This is known as CRAN. Now some cables are moving to passive optical networks as shown in this diagram. This is radio frequency over glass. It's called RFOG. It's a deep fiber network design, more downstream spectrum, more upstream bandwidth, improved operational expenses. So some cable companies are moving to PON, passive optical networks. Understand in your data delivery, CMTS and your cable modem are tied together. In fact, your cable modem talks to CMTS 
every 30 seconds with a handshake. The CMTS is actually controlling your cable modem for optimum data delivery dynamically. CMTS does a ton of stuff, but it's responsible for initializing and registering your modem. It sets the download and upload speeds with a binary file. It ensures security if that cable company enables it and it allows customer service to see everything about your modem. CMTS is Cable Modem Termination System. A CMTS can service between 4,000 and 150,000 subscriber modems. Its input is Ethernet. Its output can be coax, but generally it's fiber. IP traffic only provides QoS for voice over IP, and acts as a router or a switch. Here's a view of CMTS monitoring software. You can see it can actually lay out all the cable modems on a map and indicates with a red, a yellow, or a green indicator the health of your modem. Here's another great view of data flow in a cable network. Here we see the internet from a internet connection point into the cable provider through a router through a switch into cmts and then at some point we're going to combine that video feed through a combiner send it out to the cable modems through this hybrid fiber coax system some companies are moving to this piece of equipment it's called a ccap or converged cable access platform and basically it's just taking what they did with video and the CMTS and putting it all into one box. This platform is offering traditional video and IP-based uh, broadband. It includes a CMTS inside. So here's a diagram of this new remote PHY system where we have a CCAP, which is representative of both video input and what the CMTS normally does with data, data upstream and downstream, plus video and down to a remote fiber node and that brings to the cable modem data upstream and downstream and then video to the set top boxes for the cable tvs the importance of a ccap versus a cmt is that they can from one central piece of equipment see both video and data problems in the entire cable transmission system so here i can see that where we're transmitting sport video, that there is a loss of signal in my cable plant where I see DOCSIS, the news feed, a video on demand, they're all fine. So exactly what is between my modem and CMTS? Well, a lot of stuff. There are optical nodes, there are coax trunk lines, there's fiber optics, there are amplifiers and repeaters. Basically, amplifiers and repeaters are synonymous. Then they have splitters, and then they have taps, and then, obviously, your cable modem. So there's lots of equipment between the CMTS and your cable modem, which is why you can have lots of problems with data to your home. This diagram is very nice, and it shows you some of the maximum distances. So I've got my CMTS on the left, and I can go fiber to a fiber node, which you see a picture of that in the top right, that's a fiber node. And there's a maximum distance of about 40 kilometers between a CMTS and the furthest fiber node. And then once we get to where we're dealing with coax, then we've only got about a 1500 meter distance that we can do with uh, coax trunk lines. Coax trunk lines can carry between 200 to 2,000 household. They're a cable that has 75 ohms of impedance. Now these are fiber optic modules and some of them can be in the ground, typically in your neighborhood. Some of them can be hanging on a telephone pole. These are very expensive. These are smaller fiber nodes and typically these would go into like a school or a building or a hospital and they are able to distribute both DOCSIS as well as video to a large building or facility. So here's an example of bringing the cable system to a large building, different pieces of equipment that they would use to do that. You can use these same devices for distributing cable to remote areas. We can bring a fiber node and then split it off to a smaller one and get about 10,000 feet of fiber before we have to turn into coax. This is some of the equipment that you see in your transmission line or your, your hybrid fiber coax system to get 
data to your home. These are taps and splitters that they use to bring, say, to a hotel. They'll bring the cable system to that facility and then they'll split it off into rooms. Because their loss of signal throughout this cable system, there is repeaters and amplifiers and splitters throughout the entire system. And this is what they look like. Now, never, never touch a piece of equipment in the cable system without first using this device. This is called a FVD, a foreign voltage detector. And it protects you should something go wrong with the power supply inside the amplifier or the splitter. You don't ever want to touch, open up a cover and touch a piece of equipment out in the cable plant system ever without using an FVD. This basically will help you determine is there any potential voltage on the casing of those devices before you mess with anything. If you don't, you can get a really nasty shock. So this will prevent you from getting shocked. Make sure you have an FVD. As you get into your home, they will take the cable and then split it. One feed will go to your cable modem. Other cable feeds will go to your set-top boxes within your home or house or business. Now in delivering data to your home, there's also what is known as CPE, Customer Premise Equipment. Most customers do not own their cable modem. They lease it from the cable company. CTMS controls this device. It upgrades the firmware via TFTP server. It reboots the cable modem remotely. It allows the customer service to see signal to noise values and errors in the RF signal. It controls the modem output RF power. It requires the modem to handshake. Now you can get from your cable provider either a gateway or a cable modem. Most customers, it makes sense to get a gateway. It's got a cable modem in it, a router, a firewall, access point, if that's what you want. But in businesses, they simply want a cable modem. I want Ethernet, RJ45 jack on the back, and an IP address, and that's it. I'll take care of the router, the firewall, everything else. If you get your cable modem from your cable company, you'll generally get as cheap a modem as possible based on the data plan that you pay for. If you request a data plan that's as high as one gig, you're probably going to get a DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem. If you buy your own cable modem, you're typically going to see a WAN connection today at about 2.5 gigabits. You're going to get an IP address from your cable company, and if they provide the cable modem, you'll pay a rental fee per month. Now, DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem does support up to 10 gigabits on a downstream. If you get a cable gateway, it's going to usually have cable modem built in, voice over IP, router, firewall, access point. That makes perfect sense for the home user. So what happens when you boot a cable modem? First of all, you have internal firmware that begins the process of initializing the hardware. Then the cable modem begins to boost its RF amplifiers to try to find a CMTS device. This looks for a single downstream channel. CMTS broadcasts enough information to identify downstream channels and upstream channels. The cable modem begins what's called ranging, it begins to discover the RF parameters that it needs to work in. And then the CMTS, if it has security built in, will request a digital certificate from the modem. At some point, the CMTS device will now see the modem in the system. The DHCP server will provide it an IP address. A TFTP server will send a binary file to configure that modem based on your service plan. A time of day server delivers an accurate time to the modem, and the CMTS activates the MAC layer resources of that modem. Now, all modems timeshare. Nobody on a cable system has dedicated access to the network. You all share the resources. They use fancy things like frequency division, multiple access, and time division, multiple access. But bottom line, depending on how the operator provides a shared system, your cable modem shares the access to the network with other modems. The speed that you get for downloads and uploads obviously is based on the plan that you purchase. But when you purchase a plan, 
they add more channels, they begin to channel bond to give you more speed. So if you pay for a higher plan, you're going to get more channels bonded to give you those higher download speeds. If you get the most basic plan, you're going to get only one or two channels for your download. If you're watching this at this point in the video, you are a hardcore technology person. 90% of the people who are on YouTube who watch a video that I create are gone in three minutes. So the fact that you're watching me right now tells me you're pretty hardcore and you're the very reason we do all the work, all the video editing, all the preparation is because of you. You're the person we're after. You want to learn, you want to understand, and you're willing to watch 20 25 minutes, 30 minutes of just geek stuff. And we really, really appreciate you. One way that you can help us tremendously is support us by liking a video and subscribing. It's simple, two clicks, and it doesn't cost you anything. And it really, really helps us. If you can join, that's great. It really does help us. It's $2 and something and a month. That's a cup of coffee a month. We really, really appreciate it. But it's more important if you can like and subscribe. And it's the the best way of supporting this channel. Let's talk about cable problems. One of the first cable problems that we want to talk about is ingress noise. You don't realize it, but your home has a lot of items, a lot of equipment that generate RF noise. For example, your cell phone. My cell phone, it's a transmitter. It transmits and receives. And if my transmitted cellular signal from my cell phone gets into the cable system, it can cause problems. I have a wireless device that's a transmitter that can also bleed into your cable system. So any RF signal that leaks into the return path from any cable source that noise accumulates and funnels upstream into the CMTS. 80% of this problem comes from customer's home or a drop. Tightening up a connector can solve the problem. Take a look at the graph on the top right. This was the customer signal and they were having problems. You can see my noise, noise floor, which is in green, goes as high as negative 40 dB, which is not good. Once they talk the customer into tightening all the connectors on their set-top boxes, cable modems, all their cables, their noise floor went down to minus 55. So something simple as tightening connectors is a good start for solving an ingress noise problem. Here's the problem. It could be a neighbor or someone else in your neighborhood that's allowing ingress noise. If that happens, a cable tech can use a pre-equalization analyzer to determine which customer is the problem and hopefully solve the problem. Here we have an example of LTE cellular coming into the cable system. And what CTMS does is it actually excludes that band so that it's not interfering with the rest of the system. So here's a cable signal being impacted by what's known as impulse noise. You can see these small, quick, jagged pulses of noise in the, the RF signal. These really impact voice over IP or a Zoom call with dropouts and so you start getting robotic voices and all that good stuff. Some of the sources for impulse noise are poor insulators on an electrical line. Let's say you've got a cable telephone pole and you're getting arcing on that electrical line or if you've got welding going on in a nearby area and it's leaking into the system you can get these impulse noise and it really impacts especially voice over IP. Cable modem, blue screen of death. Well, we don't see a blue screen on a cable modem, but if your cable modem is on, but no data is flowing through it, and you can reboot that modem and it works again, that's a blue screen of death for a cable modem. Basically, the operating system has crashed. It's usually associated with dynamic updates. It happens a lot when a cable company is rolling out new technology. A single best recommendation is your channels move them away from anything below 30 megahertz. Another problem within your home is cable mismatch impedance. If you have stapled coax cable, you can see here the coax cable has been stapled into place, say in your attic, that staple can cause problems by deforming the structure of the coax cable. You actually change the impedance of the cable. Bad. Uh, nicked cables, poor connectors, old cables or connectors, crimped connect cables. If you bend that cable too harshly, instead of allowing it to loop, you'll notice a lot of times when you see 
cable installed, if they want to do a 90 degree turn or a 45 degree turn, they'll put a loop in the cable. They just won't bend the cable. When you change the characteristics of the coax cable, you're changing the impedance, which is going to cause drops. Another common problem within the home is signal level. Your cable provider brings one cable feed into your home. If you have a lot of set-top boxes for TVs and then you have your cable modem, they're probably gonna bring in a high-quality splitter that will take that RF single feed and they will carefully monitor the RF output on all of these splitter outputs to your cable boxes and make sure that you have a very high level clean RF to your cable modem. Now, if Joe goes out and decides he's going to do this and he goes to a box store, buys a cheap splitter, he has no ability to check the RF out on all those outputs to make sure the RF levels are proper. And you're probably gonna be very unhappy with the results. Your cable modem, unlike your set top boxes for your TV, is absolutely picky on the RF level that it has to have to operate properly. Old connectors, improperly tightened connectors, can lower your signal to noise ratio, which is deadly for your cable modem. It may not impact your set-top TVs as much, but it will bring down that cable modem in a heartbeat. My cable modem is rebooting or reinitializing constantly. Usually your cable modem transmit power is too low, you've got too much attenuation between the modem and CMTS, or you've got too much power into the modem, or your modem's overheating. So anytime, this is called cable flapping, and basically it just keeps rebooting and reinitializing. Definitely want to have someone come out and take a look at your RF power and make sure you're not overheating that modem.